Hi friends, my name is Cindy and I am one of the children's librarians at Portland Public Library's Children's Room and we're going to do a read aloud and what I'm starting to read today is The House with a Clock in Its Walls by John Belairs, one of my favorite authors. The pictures are done by Edward Gorey, a famous illustrator. And there are lots of pictures inside that I'll show you, like this is the house. So, the house with a clock in its walls. For Priscilla, who lets me be myself. Chapter one. Louis Barnevelt fidgeted and wiped his sweaty palms on the seat of the bus that was roaring toward New Zebedee. The year was 1948, and it was a warm, windy summer evening. Outside, that is. Lewis could see the moonlit trees tossing gently beyond his window, which was sealed shut, like all of the windows on the bus. He looked down at his purple corduroy trousers, the kind that go whip, whip when you walk. He put his hand up and rubbed it across his hair, which was parted in the middle and slicked down with wild root cream oil. His hand was greasy now, so he wiped it on the seat again. His lips were moving, and he was saying a prayer. It was one of his altar boy prayers. Kia tu, de, uh, tu es Deus fortitudu mea, quare me repulsisti, et quare tristis insedo dum affigit me inimicus? For thou, O God, art my strength. Why have you cast me off? And why do I go sorrowful while the enemy afflicts me? He tried to remember more prayers, but the only one he could come up with was another question. Quare tristis es anima mea et quare conturbas me? Why art thou sorrowful, O my soul, and why do you trouble me? It seemed to Lewis that all he could think of these days were questions. Where am I going? Who will I meet? Will I like them? What will happen to me? Louis Barnevelt was 10 years old. Until recently, he had lived with his parents in a small town near Milwaukee, but his father and mother had been killed suddenly one night in an auto accident, and now Louis was on his way to New Zebedee, the county seat of Capernaum County in the state of Michigan. He was going to live with his uncle Jonathan, whom he had never met in his life. Of course, Lewis had heard a few things about Uncle Jonathan, like that he smoked and drank and played poker. These were not such bad things in a Catholic family, but Lewis had two maiden aunts who were Baptists, and they had warned him about Jonathan. He hoped that the warnings would turn out to be unnecessary. As the bus rounded a curve, Lewis looked at his reflection in the window next to his seat. He saw a moony, fat face with shiny cheeks, the lips on the face were moving. Lewis was saying the altar boy prayers again, this time with the wish that they might make Uncle Jonathan like him. Judica me Deus, judge me, O God. No, don't judge me, help me to live a happy life. It was five minutes to nine when the bus pulled up in front of Heemsoth's Rexall drugstore in the town of New Zebedee. Lewis got up, wiped his hands on his trousers, and tugged at the enormous cardboard suitcase that hung out over the edge of the metal rack. Lewis's father had bought the suitcase in London at the end of World War II. It was covered with ripped and faded Cunyard line stickers. Lewis pulled hard, and the suitcase lurched down on his head. He staggered back across the aisle with the suitcase held perilously in the air. Then he sat down suddenly, and the suitcase landed in his lap with a lump. Oh, come on, don't kill yourself before I have a chance to meet you. There in the aisle stood a man with a bushy red beard that was streaked in several places with white. His big Mac khaki trousers were bulged out in front by his pot belly, and he was wearing a gold buttoned red vest over a blue work shirt. Lewis noticed that the vest had four pockets. There were pipe cleaners sticking out of the top two, and a chain of paper clips was strung between the lower pair. One end of the chain was hooked to the winding knob of a gold watch. Jonathan Van Olden Barnevelt took his steaming pipe out of his mouth and held out his hand. Hi, Lewis. I'm your Uncle Jonathan. I recognized you from a picture your father once sent me. Welcome to New Zebedee. 
Lewis shook hands and noticed that the back of Jonathan's hand was covered with a springy mat of red hair. The coat of hair ran right up his sleeve and disappeared. Lewis wondered if he had red hair all over his body. Jonathan hefted the suitcase and started down the steps of the bus. Good Lord, what a monster. It ought to have wheels on the bottom. Ugh, did you pack some of the bricks from your house? Lewis looked so sad at the mention of his house that Jonathan decided to change the subject. <coughs> he cleared his throat and said, well, now, as I was saying, welcome to Capernaum County and beautiful historic New Zebedee, population 6,000, not counting. A bell overhead began to strike the hour. Jonathan stopped talking. He froze on the spot. He dropped the suitcase and his arm, arms hung limp at his sides. Lewis, frightened, looked up at him. Jonathan's eyes were glazed. The bell continued to toll. Lewis looked up. The sound was coming from a tall brick steeple across the street. The arches of the belfry made a howling mouth and two gaping eyes. Below the mouth was a large glowing clock face with iron numerals. Clang! Another stroke. It was a deep-throated iron bell, and its sound made Lewis feel hopeless and helpless. Bells like that always did. But what was wrong with Uncle Jonathan? The tolling stopped. Jonathan broke out of his trance. He shook his head convulsively and with a jerky motion, raised his hand to his face. He was sweating profusely now. He mopped his forehead and his streaming cheeks. <clears throat> oh, sorry, Lewis. I, I just remembered that I, had, that I had left a kettle boiling on the stove. I always phase out like that when I remember something I've forgotten or vice versa. Bottom of the pot's probably ruined by now. Come on, let's get moving. Lewis looked hard at his uncle, but he said nothing. Together, the two of them started to walk. They left the brightly lit main street, and before long, they were trotting briskly down a long tree-lined avenue called Mansion Street. The overhanging boughs made Mansion Street into a long, rustling tunnel. Pools of lamplight stretched off into the distance. As they walked, Jonathan asked Lewis how his schoolwork was coming and whether he knew what George Kell's batting average was this year. He told him that he would have to become a Tigers fan now that he lived in Michigan. Jonathan did not complain anymore about the suitcase, but he did stop frequently to set it down and flex his reddened hand. It seemed to Lewis that Jonathan talked more loudly in the darkness between the streetlights, though why he did this, Lewis couldn't say. Grown-ups were not supposed to be afraid of the dark. And anyway, this was not a dark, lonely street. There were lights on in most of the houses, and Lewis could hear people laughing and talking and slamming doors. His uncle was certainly a strange person, but he was strange in a likable way. At the corner of Mansion and High, Jonathan stopped. He set down the suitcase in front of a mailbox that said, for deposit of mail only. I live at the top of the hill, said Jonathan, pointing up. High Street was very well named. Up they went, leaning forward and plodding slowly. Lewis asked Jonathan several times if he could carry the suitcase, but each time Jonathan said, no thanks, he could manage it. Lewis began to be sorry that he had packed all those books and lead soldiers. When they got to the top of the hill, Jonathan set down the suitcase. He took out a red bandana handkerchief and mopped his face with it. Well, there it is, Lewis, Barnevelt's folly. What do you think of it? Lewis looked. He saw a three-story stone mansion with a tall turret on the front. The whole house was lit up, downstairs, upstairs, and upper upstairs. There was even a light in the little oval window that was set like an eye in the bank of shingles at the top of the turret. In the front yard grew a large chestnut tree. Its leaves rustled in the warm summer breeze. Jonathan was standing at parade rest, his hands behind him, his legs wide apart. Again, he said, what do you think of it, Lewis, eh? I love it, Uncle Jonathan. I've always want to, wanted to live in a mansion and this is sure some mansion. Lewis walked up to the frilly fence and touched one of the iron pom-poms that ran in a row along the top. He stared at the sign that spelled out 100 in red glass reflectors. Is it real, Uncle Jonathan? The house, I mean? 
Jonathan glanced at him strangely. Yes? Yes. Yes, of course it is. It's real. Let's go inside. Jonathan lifted the loop of shoestring that held the gate shut. The gate squeaked open, and Lewis started up the walk. Jonathan followed close behind, lugging the suitcase. Up the front steps they went. The front hall was dark, but there was a light at the far end of it. Jonathan set down the suitcase and put his arm around Lewis. Come on, let's go in. Don't be bashful. It's your house now. Lewis walked down the long hall. It seemed to take forever. At the other end, he emerged into a room full of yellow light. There were pictures in heavy gilt frames on the wall. There was a mantelpiece covered with a wild assortment of junk. There was a big round table in the middle of the room, and over in the corner was a gray-haired woman in a baggy purple dress. She was standing with her ear to the wall, listening. Lewis stopped and stared. He felt embarrassed. It was as if he had walked in on someone who was doing something he shouldn't be doing. He thought that he and Jonathan had made a great deal of noise coming in, but it was very apparent that the lady, whoever she was, had been surprised when he entered the room. Surprised and embarrassed, like himself. Now she straightened up, smoothed her dress, and said cheerfully, Hi there, I'm Mrs. Zimmerman. I live next door. Mrs. Oh, excuse me, Lewis found himself staring into one of the wrinkliest faces he had ever seen, but the eyes were friendly and all the wrinkles were drawn up into smile lines. He shook hands. This is Lewis Florence, said Jonathan. You remember Charlie writing about him. The bus was on time for a change. They must have gotten the driver drunk. Hey, have you been stealing any of my coins? Jonathan walked over to the table. Now Lewis noticed that the red checkered tablecloth was covered with heaps and stacks of coins, all kinds of coins, most of them foreign, donut-shaped Arabian coins with Boy Scout knots all over them, a heap of dark brown copper coins, all of which were stamped with the picture of a bald man who wore a handlebar mustache. There were big, heavy English pennies that showed Queen Victoria in various states of chinniness, and there were tiny silver coins no thicker than your fingernail. There was an egg-shaped Mexican silver dollar and a genuine Roman coin covered with green rust. But most of all, in shiny golden stacks were brass coins with Bon Pour Un Franc printed on them. Lewis liked the phrase, and since he didn't know any French, it got twisted around in his mind till it came out Bon Sour One Franc. No, I have not been stealing any of your precious brasher doubloons, said Mrs. Zimmerman in an irritated voice. I was just straightening up the stacks. Okay, brush mush. Straightening up the stacks. I've heard that one before, Hagface. But it doesn't matter because we're going to have to divvy up the coins three ways. You do play poker, don't you, Lewis? Yes, but my dad won't. He stopped. L Jonathan saw tears in his eyes. Lewis choked down a sob and went on. My, my dad wouldn't have let me play for money. Oh, we don't play for money, said Mrs. Zimmerman, laughing. If we did, this house and everything in it would belong to me. Poop it would, said Jonathan, shuffling the cards and puffing clouds of smoke from his pipe. Poop it would. Get them all divided up, Frumpy. No? Well, when you're ready, it's going to be dealer's choice, and I'm the first dealer. No ladies' games like Spit Out the Window or Johnny's Nightshirt. Straight five-card draw. Nothing wild. He puffed some more and was about to deal the first hand when he stopped and looked at Mrs. Zimmerman with a mischievous smile. Oh, by the way, he said, you might bring Lewis a glass of iced tea and get me a refill, no sugar, and bring out another plate of chocolate chip cookies. Mrs. Zimmerman stood up and clasped her hands subserviently in front of her. And how would you like your cookies, sir? Stuffed down your throat one by one or crumbled up and sifted into your shirt collar? Jonathan stuck out his tongue at her. Ignore her, Lewis. She thinks she's smart because she's got more college degrees than I have. I would be smarter than you in any case, weird beard. Excuse me, folks. I'll be back in a minute. She turned and walked to the kitchen. Jonathan dealt a practice hand while she was gone. When Lewis picked his cards up, he noticed that they were old and worn. Most of the corners were missing. But on each faded blue back was a round golden seal with an Aladdin's lamp in the middle. Above and below the seal were the words, Capernaum County 
Magician's Society. Mrs. Zimmerman returned with the cookies and iced tea, and the game began in earnest. Jonathan gathered up the cards and cut them together with a very professional zzz. He shuffled and started to deal. Lewis sipped his iced tea and felt very comfortable, very at home. They played until midnight, by which time Lewis had red and black spots in front of his eyes. Pipe smoke hung in layers over the table and rose in a column from the shade of the floor lamp. It made the lamp seem magic, like the one on the playing cards. And there was something else magic about the game. Lewis won. He won a lot. Usually he had rotten luck, but in this game, he got straight flushes, royal flushes, four of a kind. Not all of the time, but enough to keep winning steadily. Maybe it was because Jonathan was such a lousy poker player. What Mrs. Zimmerman had said was certainly true. Whenever Jonathan had a good hand, he snortled and chortled and blew smoke out of both corners of his mouth. When he had a bad hand, he sulked and chewed his pipe stem impatiently. Mrs. Zimmerman was a crafty player who could bluff you under the table with a pair of deuces, but that night she just wasn't getting the cards. Maybe that's why Lewis was winning. Maybe, but he had his doubts. For one thing, he could have sworn that once or twice when he was reaching out to turn over a card that had been dealt to him, the card had changed. It had changed just like that while he was picking it up. This never happened when Lewis was dealing, but it did happen when Jonathan or Mrs. Zimmerman were dealing. And more than once, he had been about to throw in a hand when after a second look, he discovered that the hand was a good one. It was odd. The mantle clock cleared its throat with a whir and started to chime midnight. Lewis shot a quick glance at Uncle Jonathan, who was sitting there perfectly composed, puffing his pipe. Or was he composed? He seemed to be listening for something. The other clocks all over the house joined in. Lewis sat and chanted, listening to high-pitched dings, tinny wangs, melodious electric doorbell sounds, cuckoos from cuckoo clocks, and deep, sinister Chinese gongs roaring, wow, wow. These and many other clock sounds echoed through the house. Now and then, during this concert, Lewis looked at Jonathan. Jonathan did not look back. He was staring at the wall, and his eyes had that glazed look again. Mrs. Zimmerman sat through the whole thing with her eyes fixed on the tablecloth. The last clock to strike was the grandfather clock in the study. It made a noise like a steamer trunk full of tin plates falling slowly and solemnly down a flight of stairs. When it stopped striking, Jonathan looked up. Hmm, <clears throat> yes. Where were we? Uh, well, Lewis, it's midnight, isn't it? Game's over, time for bed. Jonathan cleared the table briskly. He gathered up the playing cards, stacked them, and put a rubber band around them. Snap! Then he reached under the table and came up with a red tin candy box with a picture of the New Zebedee County Courthouse on the lid. He scraped the clattering coins into the box, snapped the lid shut, pushed back his chair, wrapped out his pipe into a saucer, and folded his hands into his lap. Well, and what do you think of 100 High Street, Lewis? I think it's wonderful, Uncle Jonathan. I like the house and I like the town and I like you two an awful lot. Lewis wasn't lying. In spite of Jonathan's strange behavior and the eavesdropping habits of Mrs. Zimmerman, he had had a very good time during his first evening in New Zebedee. In fact, for most of the evening, he had had a great deal of trouble keeping himself from jumping up and down in his seat. He had been told that it was a bad thing to do in company. Jonathan took Lewis's suitcase upstairs, and Lewis got his first look at his new room. There was a tall black bed with battlements at the top of the headboard and footboard. In the corner was a black mirror that matched the bed, and near it was a black marble fireplace with a coffin-like black clock on its mantelpiece. Up against one wall was a tall glazed bookcase full of old books, and on top of the bookcase was a vase with cattails in it. In the middle of the floor was a large hooked rug. The pattern reminded Lewis of a map of the United States, a map of the U.S. done by a crazy person. Many children might have been put off by the dark woodwork of the old room, but Lewis loved it. 
he imagined that this was the sort of room Sherlock Holmes would have slept in. Lewis got into his pajamas, put on his bathrobe and slippers, and shuffled down the hall to the bathroom. When he got back, he found that Jonathan had just finished building a fire in his fireplace. Jonathan got up and brushed twigs off his vest. Well, Lewis, there you are. Need anything else? Gee, no, I guess not, Uncle Jonathan. This is a great room. I've always wanted a room with a fireplace in it. Jonathan smiled. He went over to the bedside table and turned on the reading lamp. Read as long as you like tonight, Lewis. Remember, school doesn't start for another three weeks. I don't know if I'll read much after all that poker playing, said Lewis, yawning. But thanks anyway. Good night, Uncle Jonathan. Good night, Lewis. Jonathan started to close the door, but he stopped. Oh, by the way, Lewis, I hope all these clocks don't keep you awake. They're kind of noisy, but, well, I like them. Good night, he closed the door. Lewis stood there with a puzzled frown on his face. There was something going on in this house that he couldn't quite get hold of. He thought of Jonathan standing paralyzed while the clock in the church steeple tolled. He thought of Mrs. Zimmerman listening at the wall. It was strange. Oh well, he thought, shrugging his shoulders. People are funny sometimes. Lewis climbed into bed and turned off the light. A few minutes later, he turned it back on. He realized that he was still tense, excited, and wide awake. He climbed out of bed and walked over to the shaky looking bamboo bookcase that stood by the closet door. What a lot of old dusty books. He pulled one out and wiped the dust off with his sleeve. The faded gilt letters on the black buckram spine said, John L. Stoddard's Lectures, Volume 9, Scotland, England, London. Lewis opened the book and flipped through the slick, glossy pages. He held the book up to his nose. It smelled like old spice talcum powder. Books that smelled like that were usually fun to read. He threw the book onto his bed and went to his suitcase. After rummaging about for a while, he came up with a long, narrow box of chocolate-covered mints. He loved to eat candy while he read, and lots of his favorite books at home had brown smudges on the corners of the pages. A few minutes later, Lewis was sitting up in bed with his pillows propped behind him. He was reading about how the Scotch nobles had murdered poor Rizzio right in front of Mary, Queen of Scots. Stoddard compared Rizzio to a purple velvet plum spurting plum juice in all directions. The nobles dragged the poor man kicking and screaming into the hallway where they stabbed him some more. 56 times, said Stoddard, though he didn't say who counted the stabs. Lewis flipped the page and bit into a peppermint patty. Now Stoddard was talking about the permanence of bloodstains and wondering whether or not the stain on the hall floor in Holyrood really was Rizzio's blood or not. Lewis began to yawn. He turned off the light and went to sleep. But he was awakened. Quite suddenly, a little while later, he had been dreaming that he was being chased by the Queen of Spades. Now he sat up, wide awake. He was scared and he didn't know why. Creak, creak. Someone was tiptoeing down the hall. Lewis sat still and listened. Now the sound was outside his door. Now it was going away down the hall. Creak, creak, creak. Lewis slid out of bed. As slowly and carefully as he could, he tiptoed to the door. He opened it just as slowly and carefully. He didn't open it far, just a crack. He looked out. The hall was dark except for a glimmering gray window down at the far end. But Lewis could hear someone moving. And now he saw the faint pale circle of a flashlight beam moving over the wallpaper. Frightened, Lewis pulled the door shut and then opened it just a crack. The flashlight beam had stopped. Now the figure with the flashlight brought his fist down on the wall, hard. <coughs> Lewis heard little clots of plaster falling down into the space between the walls. The figure pounded again and again. Lewis stared and opened the door wider. Now the shadowy intruder stepped back and Lewis saw a bulky shadow against the hall window. A bulky bearded shadow with a pipe in its mouth. Jonathan! 
Lewis closed the door as softly as he could and leaned against it, shaking. He hoped Jonathan hadn't seen him. A horrible thought came into his mind. Was Jonathan crazy? Lewis went to the wing chair by the fire and sat down. He watched the black honeycombs as they crumbled into deep red wells. What if Jonathan were crazy? His parents had always warned him against crazy people, the type that lured you into their cars and offered you candy with glue in it. Or was it glue? He couldn't remember, but Jonathan didn't really seem like that kind of person, or the kind that sneaked into your room at night and stabbed you to death. Lewis sighed. He would just have to wait and see what happened. He went back to bed and had a dream in which he and Jonathan were running round and round the block that had the church on it, the church with the monster-faced steeple. All the houses on the block were lit up, but they couldn't go into any of them to hide. Something tall and dark and shapeless was following them. Finally, they stopped in front of the church, and the tower began to sway as if it were made of rubber. The howling face got closer and closer, and then the dream changed. Lewis was sitting in a room full of glittering coins. He let them run clinking through his fingers until morning came. And that was the end of part one. The next time we will read part two, which begins with chapter two. My name is Cindy. I am one of the children's librarians at Portland Public Library in the children's room. And I'll look forward to seeing you again for the next part. Bye-bye, friends.